Hello and welcome to the Helmsley Postdoctoral Teaching Scholars Capstone Symposium. My name is Beth Luoma and it has been my privilege to serve as the director of the Helmsley program for the past almost three years. Before I go any further, I would like to take the opportunity to thank some very important people who have made today's event possible. We obviously have the hard work of our four Helmsley scholars and you'll have the chance to hear from each of them today. The program would not have been possible without our CTL executive director and principal investigator of the Helmsley grant, Jenny Frederick, who together with our program officers at the Helmsley Charitable Trust and many faculty and administrators at the University of Bridgeport and Housatonic Community College had the foresight and vision to design this remarkable program and frankly, to give us all jobs. <laughs> Our program has also benefited from the insights of expert evaluators, including Jan, Jane Manweiler and Glenn Davenport, as well as too many faculty, staff, and administrator collaborators to name at Yale, UB, and HCC. We are grateful to all of you for the ways you have supported the growth of these talented postdocs and thrilled that many of you could be with us here today. I would also like to thank Jenny Ashley, who's still hiding out in the hall there, and Patrick O'Brien, also there. Um, they are STEM Education Administrative Assistant and CTL Communications Officers, um, who both worked diligently to make sure that today's event was well organized and well advertised. We'd also like to thank the CTL broadcast team, who is recording our event, so it will be available to our colleagues who could not attend today. You are certainly about to witness the results of a team effort. We have an exciting program planned for you today. Right now, we're in the middle of our welcome and introduction. After I provide a bit of context about our program, you get the chance to hear from each of our four current Helmsley postdoctoral scholars. So we'll hear from Claudia de Grande, uh, sitting at the same table, building communities of students and faculty. We'll hear from Marco Bonet Matisse, tenfold increase in attendance of calculus tutoring sessions, facilitating collaboration and enhancing learning at UB. We'll hear from Savan Carl, inclusive teaching practices in a classroom community and beyond. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Brett Smith, Cartes, improving preparation for calculus through gaming. And lastly, we'll have a closing by Jenny Frederick before we launch you into our celebratory reception outside. As I mentioned earlier, we are celebrating the culmination of a three-year program. I feel privileged to have worked with not four, but a total of six Helmsley scholars. Many of you may also know Zosha Krusberg, who was part of the Helmsley program for the 2015 to 2016 year before securing a faculty position at Northwestern University. Lake Bookman was also a Helmsley scholar from 2015 to 2017, working closely with Yale's math department and establishing our partnership with the University of Bridgeport before accepting a position in industry. To provide some context for the impact of our work, that our Helmsley scholars are going to share today, I would like to give some background on what they've been up to for the past three years. Our program was initially conceived to give recent PhDs in physics or math who were interested in teaching focused careers the opportunity to acquire significant teaching training and mentorship. And so year one was focused on training. They attended summer institutes on scientific teaching, which is a national faculty development program that we run here out of Yale. <laughs> All right, I think we are officially back. So pop quiz, what was I talking about? <laughs> we were talking about the postdocs and all the incredible things that they've done over the past three years. And so year one was devoted to training. So the academic year 2015 to 2016, they attended a summer institute on scientific teaching and they taught introductory STEM courses here at Yale. In year two, they really emerged as leaders. So they facilitated our summer institutes on scientific teaching. And they also led course innovations here at Yale, serving as course coordinators. And they also began to establish relationships with our faculty at Housatonic and at UB through course observations and a number of meetings. And then lastly, in year three, this is the year we're currently in, this has really been our extension phase. And so they again emerged as leaders within our Summer Institutes community, serving as facilitators, and they've been teaching our introductory STEM courses at our partner institutions. And I can say from observing every one of them every semester, that's been a true privilege to watch their evolution as educators. Now I have too many things going on, so I have to, there we go. Okay, great. So we want a snapshot for you. What has our program been like by the numbers? A few fun facts to throw out to the room. So we have trained six Helmsley postdoctoral teaching scholars. They have facilitated seven summer institutes on scientific teaching. They have taught 16 unique STEM courses. They have 
organized and led 21 STEM education seminars. And as we watch them depart, I'm putting a little asterisk here to remind myself that we'll be looking to all of you for our ideas for our seminar series. So during the reception, there is a suggestion box out there. And if the true incentive of your intellectual contribution isn't enough, we're going to do a random drawing for a CTL moleskin. So please make sure you put in your ideas into that box. And the other thing I wanted to go back here to mention too with our summer institutes is we've really been privileged to have faculty teams from both Housatonic and UB attending those institutes as well. Our postdocs have attended 23 disciplinary and education conferences. They've taught 33 individual course sections. And taken together, they've taught over 1,300 unique undergraduate students. So I'd say that they've done a lot over the past few years. I think what will become obvious today is that the influence of our postdocs by no means stopped at their classroom walls. The successes of our Helmsley scholars are the result of their talents and hard work, but also the support of so many here in this room today. And so, this symposium and the reception that will follow is at once a celebration of our Helmsley scholars and a display of gratitude to all of you. So let's begin. Claudia will be our first presenter. Each of our Helmsley scholars will present for about 15 minutes and then we'll allow up to five minutes per question following each presentation. So without further ado, Claudia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Get familiar with this spot. So it's been really challenging to only have 15 minutes to summarize three years of teaching both at Yale and at Hazatonic Community College. So I tried to look for some com common trend or common object actually. So what I found is a table. A table has been sort of emblematic of my growth and the projects that I've been involved with. So I'm going to talk about tables today. Those are four of the main tables I've been involved with. Uh, some are at Yale and some are at Hazatonic Community College. I want to start by talking to talk about the Yale classroom, the Teal classroom. Those tables are um, uh, circular tables is right that, then in Hill House Street. And this is where how the Teal classroom looked like when I started as a teaching assistant. Very crowded, students still had their laptop open, so that doesn't happen anymore. It was very intimidating, but over the years I got very comfortable in that environment. And what I want to tell you about is uh, a story about the first year when we taught um, a, class, uh, a class year at Yale. I think I... Sorry, I just have to do one little thing. So we basically did an experiment. One second. We uh, offer students the option to either take our phys physics introductory classes for pre-meds and biology majors, either in this classroom, that's an overview of the class, or they could have chosen to take exactly the exact same classroom in a very nice traditional lecture hall up the hill in the chemistry department. So the two classes were, the two sections were run in parallel at the same time. We were two instructors, myself and Simon Mokri, and then myself and Rona Ramos. And we were developing the material together. So the classroom were exact, the class was exactly the same, same homework, same, same assignment. The only variable was the environment. A student could choose one versus the other classroom. And I have to say that the way we encourage group work and collaboration was exactly the same. And it was not more suitable for one classroom versus the other one. So the question that we asked was, does the classroom make a difference? How is the experience of students in, around the table or sitting just in a row? So I gather uh, data from the uh, final grade of students in this class. So those are the histogram of the final grade of, on the left is the teal classroom, on the right, the lecture hall. And if we look at the average grade, what happened is it's the first semester, students in the lecture hall did almost significantly <coughs> better than students in the teal classroom. What, what we thought back then is that there is some sort of self-selection maybe that good students, motivated students are somewhat skeptical of this new classroom with tables. We don't know what that, let, what that is. Let's stick with the traditional classroom. That's somewhat confirmed uh, by a pre-post test that we ran for the class. What you look for pre with pre-post tests is the average gain and the average gain was the same for the two classrooms but students in the lecture hall had a significantly, significantly higher pre-test. What is interesting to us then is what happened in the spring semester. So most of the students are required to take two semesters of the class, so they take the first and then the second semester. So what happened in the spring semester? The opposite happened. 
I have to say that most of the students were in the same classroom. They didn't really uh, switch. Some of them switched, but that was in both directions, so I kind of make sure there wasn't a significant uh, shift. And so what happened is that now students in the teal classroom, the classroom with the tables, perform significantly better than the students in the lecture hall. More precisely, to look at this data, what I did, I filter sort of for what I call the overlap students. I mean, the, the students that were actually both in the fall and in the spring. Some student might take the class the following year, or they came back from a, a year abroad or something. So I only took the students that were actually in the classroom both semesters. So if you look at this more carefully, I analyze this, dividing this in three categories. So basically, based on their grade in the fall semester, I divided the students in high performing, media performing, and low performing. So this is an A, this is A minus B plus, and then this B and, my, and less than that. And I looked how the performance was followed in the spring semester. So this was very interesting. So what happened is that medium and high performing students had a comparable performance, no matter in which classroom they were. But low performing students performed significantly better only in the teal classroom. Of course, this is just data. There is so much more I can add as an experience and anecdotes as a teacher teaching in the two classroom and experiencing the energy and uh, all the stories that can happen in a classroom. But I'm going to stop here just to kind of move forward and just say it seems that there is maybe a teal table effect. I didn't clarify that these students choose to sit at the table and that year they sat with the same people for the entire semester. So my suggestion is that there is a feeling of a community that it did take over two semesters to be developed that I think would make a difference if you're sitting in a, at a table or if you're sitting in a classroom. I would say a student is not very motivated might fall behind if you can sit alone in a big large lecture hall while if you have a classroom where you're sitting on with meet your, your friends you might feel like more motivated to, to work harder. But let me just now guess and show you what are students' comments. So I'll, I'll leave you a few seconds if you can read through those. This is from the anonymous survey that we do every semester. I just want to highlight a few words that are significant. There is an accessibility to the instructor that clearly makes a difference. And I'm sorry you're sitting in a row, but I would like to walk around and show you how you can access an instructor if you have tables and you walk around. There isn't any more a centrality, but the center is at the table, and students can really connect with you much better. There is clearly a feeling of a more personalized and collaborati collaborative environment because you sit with friends at the table. So this is about student in the lecture. There is much more that happened at the tables outside the lectures. And so what I want to talk about next is uh, study hall. So study hall is a very simple thing, but it turned out to be one of the most successful tools of our classroom. I've brought it to Alsatonic, it's been used in physics a lot, and it's very simple, but it's great. So let me sell study hall to you. So the idea of study hall in a nutshell is you're going to hold office hours in a just more inclusive way. Most of us have offices up on, the, on, the, on Science Hill. It's a very dark, small offices, and students come up there all, all concerned to ask a question to you. Forget about that now. You come down the hill. You go to a place that is convenient for a student at the time that is convenient for, for the students. So that's what study hall is. So there are two or three times a week, two or three hours, where we meet in the Teal classroom. And the main point is that we sit at the table with the students. So that's where somewhat the change uh, happens. This, again, you're not an instructor anymore. You're sitting with them. And so besides, of course, helping them with the homework, you get to talk about so many other things. I get to know about their extracurricular activities. They chit we teach about things that happen on campus that they wouldn't find out otherwise. So it's really a way to build a community. And I also want to show you some fun pictures of, of course, social events that we had. Uh, they build some stuff at the beginning of the semester. We have some group formation. Um, and I also have to say that a study hall, there are instructors, which is fundamental, but they're also teaching assistants, peer tutors, those are undergraduate students that took the class before. So the <laughs> students can come and they can decide to talk to me, but they don't have to. Actually, they also just come and talk to each other. By creating this space, you facilitate group formation and the fact that they make friends with each other. Let me show you again some quotes. Uh, so what we like to ask the students in our class is, imagine you could write a short paragraph for next year's students, what would you advise to them to learn uh, and have the best experience in the class? So I sort of coded all the responses uh, from this survey, and the main ideas that come out are more, more than half of them say you should attend study hall. But in general, the good things that they say is that they value collaboration, 
uh, they are comfortable asking questions, and they also say you should get to know your professors, which is pretty nice. And I would say most of them uh, combine a, a more than uh, a couple of those. Let me show you again some comments from this survey. Those quotes sort of uh, really speak to the philosophy that we have behind the class, which is about growth, and it's okay to be wrong as long as you ask for help, help is there for you. So study hall is exactly the place where it's, there, is there is never a wrong, a wrong question to be asked, and uh, to not be afraid and always ask for help. We also have always asked these five questions over the far, of, we asked five questions of the past four semester and I averaged the results that I'm going to show you to you to sort of capture what's the atmosphere the student perceived in this class. So we asked him how did you find the atmosphere and Simon came up with his loving is the top to hostile on the other side. So this is what's the average. Uh, most of them find it welcoming. We also asked them if they feel supported by both their instructor and the classmates. So on the left we have instructors and on the, on the right we have classmates. I found interesting, and this is part also of the being human in STEM that I might be able to talk about, the fact that students feel more supported by the instructor than their classmates. So it's a good point for reflections. Another important point is ask them how the class compared to other STEM classes on the left and non-STEM classes at Yale. There is this well-known thing that STEM classes are not as welcoming as non-STEM classes. So this is pretty nice to see that half of them think that it's either about the same or better than a non-STEM class. And in general, it's definitely a much better experience than the other large STEM classes that they're used to. I want to emphasize that all these results of so these five plots that I showed you, I looked if there is any difference among uh, group racial groups and there isn't. So this is the response that has been um, you mongos, I would say, consistent with all the students in the class. A few more comments again about the class. They talk about community, friendliness, and accessibility. And one thing that we really like is that they say they don't feel like they're competing with each other. This is also because we don't grade on a curve, but that's, I guess, another story. So this has been my experience with Physics 170 and 171 here at Yale. And um, I want to talk about what happened when now last fall I started up uh, Zatoni Community College. It's been really interesting to meet new students. I can come up with a few things to summarize how uh, students at a community college are different. Their ego is not as big as the ego of Yale students. They have to be encouraged. Uh, I actually, I have to cheer for them. I have to tell them, you have to submit the homework. That's good for you. They don't have, they have a life, they work. Their study habits are not as developed as Yale students because uh, studying is not their priority. They're not so used to working groups. And so the first semester has been quite challenging because I had to sort of tune to them and get to know them. And also to my teaching style that was used to an, a different environment. So it's been, I wouldn't say rough, but it's been bumpy. But I realized when I was preparing this presentation that one of the reasons maybe why it wasn't so easy is because I was missing a table. So uh, as a tonic in the full semester, I was running study hall and the classroom and everything as I was doing here, but we didn't really have a teal class up there. <coughs> the good news is that this semester, as a tonic has been going through a renovation of both buildings and there are two wonderful rooms that really made a difference. So on the right is the new tutoring center and that's a table where I hold study hall. And on the left is what I like to call a mini teal. I love the fact that the chairs are colored. And I have to say that in January when I came in, those tables were in, in a line and I rushed there to change them and put them like that and you can confirm that they remain like that since then. So what we do right now after every lecture we go there and we work in groups and we have handout and students work in group and this has really made a difference. As I like to say my students this semester are only 15, they're loving and they're lovable, I like the class, it's, it's been wonderful. I ask them the same questions that I ask to the Yale students, and you see the loving is much higher. There are only 14 of them, but they are all very engaged. I think somebody is just always want to say that it's, the environment is hostile, whatever. Um, maybe you just click the wrong button. Um, <laughs> but I made sure at least, I was a little concerned about that one, but 100% said they feel supported by the instructors, so that hostility might come from something else. I don't know. So, um, so that's been my experience. It feels, if I felt so short, I felt like I just got used to it and it's ending, unfortunately. I want to end with one more table. 
uh, right now, just outside the library, there is uh, WLH. This room is right there where Simon had to leave because right now Savannah and I otherwise will be teaching the Being Human in STEM course. It says it's second implementation and uh, this is a course uh, that has been developed at my college a few years ago and then we imported it here at Yale. Briefly, what is this class? is a collaboration between faculty and students and the most emblematic way we sit at the table with the students. So imagine 10 or 12 students and four or five faculty in STEM, we all sit around this table. And here are some comments from the students of, this cla of the class this year, how they feel about the fact that we sit at the table with them. So this class is a completely new story and I won't have time to go through it. I just want to show you some of the successes of last year. This class was the first class that ran a workshop for faculty where students told faculty in STEM what they should do to make their classes more inclusive. It's becoming a network with people at Amherst and if you want to more, learn more about it, this is a great way, way for me to advertise. We have a summit coming up in three weeks here at Yale on a, on a Sunday because uh, it's also reading, a reading period. So if you want to hear more about this class, consider joining uh, us that day. So I'm going to end here and let you reflect on tables. And I take questions. Yes. Oh, do you want me to tell that? I had a very successful job search and I'm moving to Salt Lake City as it's called Professor of Educational Practice. So I'll be teaching, but I'll be also have time to um, be involved with exactly what I've been doing here. It feels like a natural extension of this fellowship because I'll be involved with projects in STEM education and the, the, the environment is so, has been so wonderful. So I'm very excited. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about class size. Um, classes at Yale were larger and the class at Savannah was significantly smaller. Um, in terms of either the teal setup or a classroom environment where you have tables that are more collaborative in nature, do you think that there's kind of a critical mass where it's, it's too big for students to still feel connected that way or this environment allows a large class to work in a better way than a, a traditional lecture? So it's a good question because actually it turns out that two years ago at Yale we changed the time and I ha ended up having only 13 students in the teal classroom. So there was this huge classroom empty and only two tables. And so that's a, li a little awkward sometimes when you ask them, let's talk to each other, the classroom is kind of very quiet. Um, but now that I see at House of Tonic, I only have 15 students. What has been challenging is to ask them to mix with each other, but I've been using like little tricks like what's your favorite food or where you were born to mix them with each other. So I think I'm getting better. It's all about creating, I think, uh, the, the relationship with them. And then uh, even if it's a small class, it, it works well. Yeah. So it's been more kind of practicing with different sizes. Why do you think you always treat one person with hostility? I mean, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't I'm get kidding. it, sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but when you have this more communitarian approach, if somebody is a bit of an outlier, does that ever affect how things go for you? Did you notice? Yeah, I do have those cases regularly, I have to say. People that really like to work on their own. Um, I would say I let them be because I don't feel like I should force them to be different than what they feel like. Um, I, do, I do tell them that working with other people is part of uh, anybody's career and so I ask them to move, each, move around and talk to other people. I try to connect with, with those people I try to connect more one-on-one -on -one to make sure that I, I know they're a little different but I'm okay with that. Uh, so it, I would say for small class that works well, for a bigger class is more work, but yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Frank. Thank you, yes. I forgot one thing that is great about Hazatonic. So I have a study hall on Monday afternoon because on Tuesday we have a quiz. So I always have a study hall before something important so they come to prepare. It turns out that a Hazatonic Monday afternoon is way too early for them to worry about a quiz which is on Tuesday. <laughs> but the great thing is that half of them, I would say six or seven students, do show up regularly just to hang out. 
so they just come, they sit there, they work on the homework due the same night, they tell me about other classes, we talk about other things. Some of them ask me about physics, so the others by sort of like, you know, just being there, they, hear, they, they learn something, but it's really just, just come to show up and be with each other. So it's, it's interesting. I think Yale students come to study all with a list of questions, they're like, help me with this and this and that, and um, so it's very different. But they're very appreciative, appreciating this. study hall at Pusatani, were they all at the same table? Uh, yeah, when we do, it's only six people, so we tend to sit at the uh, one or two tables, the study hall at that time, yeah. So, so it's a small class, so now we all sit at the same table, yeah, yeah. Let's thank Claudia again. Thank you for the questions. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me on the back, or should I use the microphone? Cool. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm going to share with you my experiences this past year as a Hemsley postdoctoral scholar. And if I was to summarize my experience in the last year, um, it would be fun and extremely creative. Um, I've been given, I've been granted an amount of freedom. You have no idea. Um, and as I was debating um, what is it that I wanted to share with you guys, a recurring theme that kept on popping up was the impact, which I think Beth has already alluded to. Um, and I wanted to share with you guys the project that I've been involved that has the largest, had the largest impact, but then soon I realized that um, I was serving as a vehicle for the CTL to have an impact outside of the boundaries on Ye of Yale. So um, I want you to continue, I invite you to continue to remind yourself as I um, present that um, I am just sharing with you something of what in my opinion has a great impact outside of the Yale boundaries. Both inside and outside, I part, I, I, I've, also, I don't know, I've also been part of the inside impact, uh, but this is outside of it. Um, and to begin, I want to begin for, um, with the element that I think has the largest importance, in my opinion, not only in this project, but in life in general, and that is people. And first I want to express my immense gratitude to Jennifer Frederick for the list of issues that I am not even going to go into it, except to say that it is a long list. I am extremely grateful. Um, I am also forever in depth to um, Beth for having emailed me and suggested to apply for this particular position. Um, speaking of impact, um, I would have been another statistic uh, seduced into industry, um, who, and I'm very passionate about education, so I would have been just another dot um, in, the, in the mountain amount of people that live uh, toward the industry. And finally, uh, the ease in which I have been able to navigate the UB landscape would not have been possible without the mentoring and guidance of Ryan McCulloch, who is a great person that also happens to be the math chair at UB. I'm saddened that he wasn't able to join us today. He's in a um, conference in Florida. Um, so what I want to do next is provide you a bird's eye view of my presentation. Uh, first, I want to share the context of this tutoring project uh, because I've done teaching and I want to make sure that I um, share that with you. Um, then briefly, I'm going to explore what this tutoring project has been and at the end, give you a sense of where we might go after um, this year. Um, so to begin with, a couple of milestones I've had at uh, UB is uh, my classes have been excellent, uh, have had excellent reviews from the students' perspective. My calculus three class had a 3.7 out of four, and my differential equations class a 3.6 out of four. These are university uh, students' evaluations, anonymous. Not, these aren't given by, uh, provided by me. And this only says that they like the way I teach. Uh, I hope that it translates in, into student learning, uh, into learning gains. 
I'm not going to speculate. Uh, I hope it does. Um, I've also contributed, as all of the postdocs have, to the uh, STEM education seminars. And finally, I've developed in-class mindfulness practices that had it not been for the tutoring project, which I want to highlight today, I would have spent the 10 minutes talking about this. However, I want to share a little bit uh, of what that um, entails. So um, these mindfulness exercises are an outgrowth of um, my uh, quizzes, which um, are every day. And I've been playing with them for the last seven years. And um, what I believe, uh, my, my current hypothesis in terms of what these mindfulness practices uh, do is, and I think it's a little bit of what Claudia was referring to, is uh, they accelerate the rate at which the build of trust is, um, happens. Um, I, don't, I don't think mindfulness exercises build trust. I think people build trust. But just like it was observed uh, in Claudia's talk, it took maybe, I don't know, I'm going to speculate, a year for, to see the effect of the trust built in the TIL classroom. I speculate that um, these exercises could accelerate that process. Um, so let me tell you a little bit of what I have observed in my classroom and what I use as indirect evidence that this is the case. And what I am showing, I'm going to show you next are three quotes from three students last semester. These were unsolicited um, responses. Um, and all I'm going to say is that they were written either via email or via paper. So I'm going to give you a couple seconds to read them. Please let me know if you guys on the back cannot see them. So what I want to comment is I want to direct your attention to the last two questions which were written in the blue books within the time of the final exam. And this is totally consistent with uh, the way my mindfulness exercises are implemented after the quizzes during the class where we follow a thing per share activity, then I ask my students to reflect on their own learning, and then they write down these things. I was going to do it, but usually what I do is I create a PDF, a, you know, and I give a, this PDF of, the, or the, of their progress prior to the exam so that they can see you know, what's working, what is not working. Um, I wasn't going to discuss the next slides, but uh, I realized I had more time, so I squeezed them in. Um, these are responses from this year where before they even knew anything about me, which is in blue, I asked them whether they thought I cared about their learning. This is before any mindfulness exercises were implemented in the classroom. And uh, the one on red is what happens after uh, one particularly important one that I found extremely effective at. Um, I, I think it's like lubricating the ways in which we connect to our students or the ways in which I have connected to my students. Um, I, I also ask them whether they trust my teaching style. As I said, it has been, in, it has been very creative, and, <laughs> and it's been very creative. So uh, the, the thing is that do they think that this works, or am I some um, interesting guy? And they seem to trust what I've done uh, in the classroom, at least according to this. This is one survey that I asked them, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> so that's as far as uh, the context is concerned. I've done teaching, I've played with teaching in the classroom, and now I want to shift my attention to what I really want to discuss, which is the tutoring uh, and the ways in which I've tried to improve uh, tutoring at Juby. And from, for that, I'm going to kind of like tell, run you through the chronology of it. Last semester, before my appointment began, um, I read where Lake left off, we, who is the postdoc uh, that left, and I, I luckily was able to um, fill in his uh, shoes, and he had a line that said tutoring, that was it. 
And I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel, so I went to the tutoring center, volunteered my time for a month, uh, Wednesdays uh, there, just help out, understand the audience, and um, see where can I contribute to the tutoring center. So I go there, and now what I want to do, I didn't say it, once again, the impact of the CTL is here. Um, what I did is then I was offered to hire the tutors, implement an interview process. Um, I suggested that we meet bi-weekly. It was optional last semester. And finally, I implemented a system of feedback. The last three of them are directly from the playbook of the CTL, where we had a coordinator such as Beth who implemented the interviews. She hired me as a coordinator one year. We met twice a week. And we definitely implemented uh, feedback during that time. But then what we observed having implemented this system of feedback was that uh, students weren't coming for calculus. So I go to Ryan, and I said, Is, you know, does this make sense? He says, no, we should be having more attendance uh, into this meeting. So now we have a North Star that we can follow uh, as a group. And we were ambitious. We said we are aiming for a tenfold increase in tutoring sessions attendance, which is uh, the, why the title. Um, and I was lucky enough that in the cohort that were there last semester, um, Debbie was there. And Debbie is with us today. Uh, if I'm to be honest, she's done more work in the, to make this project work than I have, and she should be the one who should be presenting here. Um, so please, please, please engage her at the end if you're curious about this tutor's perspective. However, in brief, she has facilitated the tutor-faculty interaction. She has led and coordinated the biweekly meetings this semester. I'm thinking sustainability. I did it last semester. I want to pass the baton on to her, get her to uh, experience professional development, she is right now mentoring uh, new tutors that will take on her roles um, next semester. Uh, and other many logistical stuff that I'm not even aware uh, she does, but she does. Um, I've also been lucky enough to have two tutors who have invested heavily. One of them, Chris, is with us today. And they have collaborated with faculty, facilitated this, uh, this dialogue, advertised the tutoring sessions, but most importantly, they have maintained the students' attendance. So something that I, re I noticed based on uh, focus groups with students is that they come to the tutoring sessions, they have a negative experience, they go. And Chris and Hamza have done a fantastic work at retaining those students to continue to come. Um, so we go, we get to work, and the outcome so far, Chris created this uh, data for me last night, and we've gone to a five-fold increase up until yesterday. My hope is that we still have three weeks, review sessions, finals coming. We might hit our target of um, a ten-fold increase. Um, I've also, I mean, if we include ODEs, we have an infinite fold increase. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take credit for that. <laughs> uh, but if I aggregate the two calculus and ODEs, we're at 80 percent, uh, at 80 fold, in, uh, eight fold increase. Um, so these are the outcomes. Uh, let me summarize them for you. Again, um, I'm only talking about the tutoring, but there's more that I did at UB. Um, We've increased attendance in calculus tutoring sessions. We've facilitated um, the tri this triad collaboration, which I think strengthens um, the community. And we, in my opinion, have improved undergraduate learning experience. This, I'm not, I don't think I'm telling you anything that you might have not guessed from an effort like this. However, there are more intangibles that I can um, share with you, which are, we have triggered the tutor's curiosity. And this is, in my opinion, the most powerful effect and impact that we've had on these students because now they're hungry, they're, they're curious, and um, I'm interested in capitalizing on that, on that potential. Um, we've also strengthened the sense of community and their, sel uh, their self-agency. They, uh, I, I want to be respectful, but they were a bit scattered. Now they, we're building cohesion 
and they, they're starting to demonstrate uh, some initiative, which I think is an intangible yet a very powerful. So I'm giving you numbers because uh, we're driven by numbers, but I think these two are really the effects that I'm more impressed by or more passionate about, if you will. Um, so where do we go? I was lucky enough to um, a position opened up, I applied, and I uh, was able, I'm going to be able to remain at UB for another year. So what do we do with all this potential? I am interested in implementing, and I'm dreaming, I'm telling you my dreams. Uh, I'm interested in implementing a math bridge program that is led by tutors. I'm interested in mentoring them in the course design aspect of it. Let them do all the work, just make sure that it is done well. Uh, and having them implement the bridge program themselves. Again, like I'm interested in a lot of intangibles here, professional development being one of them, and I think this serves uh, that purpose. Um, going back to the STEM education seminars, uh, this is more my personal goal, is I would like to maintain this uh, STEM education seminar series, but I would like to contribute now as a role of um, UB member. So having more um, ownership in terms of UB uh, as an institution for this uh, seminar series, but also try to get uh, stakeholders from neighboring institutions so that we can build in this little momentum. I've been, I've helped Claudia with her uh, seminar last semester, and I did one a couple, a week ago, and I think that we're starting to get some momentum going there, and I would like to keep that going if possible. Um, finally, um, I would like to involve undergraduates students in my research. Uh, my research is in theoretical nuclear physics, and I'll be curious to get some of them um, exposed to these uh, research techniques. Um, so that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Can you tell us a little about the makeup of your tutors at UB and their availability? Uh, when you say the makeup, like are they undergrad students, outside hires, graduate students? Are they available all the time? Or so they are mostly undergraduates. Um, Debbie is a graduate student. Uh, graduate students are given 24 hours. It usually is two of them, and undergraduates get uh, 70 hours. Some of them are embedded tutors in algebra. Um, I took the calculus ones, That's, those are the ones that I took ownership of. Um, they are four. Uh, one of them has seven hours, the other ones have four. They, the idea is that now that I, better, I have a better handle on who they are, is to shuffle those hours around so that um, tutors like Chris get more hours next semester. Um, and they, uh, yeah, they, they, they amount to, as I said, four calculus tutors and a total of around seven to eight tutors over, you know. But they, some of them do algebra, and I'm not as familiar with what they do when they go into embedded, uh, to the embedded classes. Another question about whether or not the students trust you. And you also said that your classroom or techniques were very creative. <laughs> so putting those together, what are the things that were sort of strange or things that students might be skeptical of that would motivate you to ask a question of whether or not you trust that your So what is it that I did that might have taken a little, with a bit suspicious? Is yes. that the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean the mindfulness, right? I ring a dong. And I asked them to be silent for a minute. And, and it, it takes them a little bit to, to get comfortable with that silence. So some of them start writing immediately. Some of them start knocking on things. And um, so the first three trials are failed trials because I'm trying to correct for this. Uh, but uh, toward the end, they embrace it. Um, it's, it's, it's like the only way that I can explain it is, it is a very visceral, low level way of engagement that I cannot articulate how it works. I can only sense it, be present, and play with it. Uh, can you give them some guidance on this practice 
or do you just let them sort of <coughs> So let me, let me explain, let me explain the, the quiz, right? So they come into the class at 1.30 sharp. There's a quiz in front of them. And they sit there by themselves for six minutes, answer it. I collect it. Once I, while I am entering the results, they are engaging in discussion, groups, and so on. Then I collect those. I show them the histogram of the first submission, and I tell them, should I discuss any of the answers? Sometimes they say a third, sometimes they say all of them. So I go through that thing per share uh, uh, process, and then at the end, what I ask them is to remain silent for a minute, uh, try to observe the reactions in terms of the quiz. And I guide them by telling them what was my goal, what, how did they feel, what were the study methods that might have worked, what were the study methods that didn't work. For one minute, they are thinking about this, and then the second minute, I let them write. And as I said, in the beginning, it's uncomfortable, they don't know what to tell me, it's personal, in the beginning it's a little bit personal, and with guidance, say this again? So they write it, they give it to me, um, I grade them, and then I read it. And in the beginning, it's very personal. It's all about me. Uh, oh, you don't ask good questions. I don't understand this thing. You're too weird. Uh, <laughs> and then I tell them, I tell them, <laughs> I tell them, look, guys, like, I get it. Please express yourself however you want. But can, can I invite you to explore your learning? Can I ask you to reflect on your learning? Not so much on whether you like this whole thing, but uh, your learning. And please complain about me with the anonymous feedback form, which is also there for them. <laughs> <laughs> and then it is slowly becomes a meta cognition exercise for them. Um, so that is one example. I have music in the beginning of the class. I play blues. And they enter, and they don't know what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> so those are the creative things that in the beginning, they are, they are trying, trying to make sense of me, but for whatever reason, they start to trust me. And like the, the, my, my mental picture is we're going to build this much trust. One person A and person B are going to build this much trust. Uh, the question is, what is the half-life that it takes to get from here to there? And these whole exercises accelerate the process, shorten the half-life of that process. Um, uh, what is it that I'm going with this? Uh, so they're going to trust me how, however much they're going to trust me. This only facilitates the build of that trust. And I'm, 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 like, I'm eccentric, so in my presentation of the class, and, uh, and, and it takes a little bit to adjust. Marco, for the summer bridge program that you're dreaming about, what is that as far as, is it face-to-face? -face? Is it expensive? Do you have funding for it? Let's just say <laughs> so, a about that. so I found out about the funding issue last week. Um, I think the funding, I'm starting to feel more optimistic about it. Now it's more the course design aspect of it that we're running short. So I'm thinking, I want to make sure that, that we do it well because it's, it's sensitive. If, it, if it's not well, I, I'm afraid uh, there won't be a second chance. So. For the second year, my hope is that someone like Chris and other tutors who have expressed a lot of interest in it, they've matured, they will mature in their uh, teaching abilities, and uh, we'll have more time to, to plan it out well. Um, it'll, I envision a five week, not shorter than that, because I don't think three weeks is enough to have any learning gains. I'm interested in learning gains, not so much. Um, um, acclimatation to the university. So that's my goal. My goal is to develop the algebra and their study habits. I, I'm teaching 200 level classes and I'm, as Claudia has already mentioned, I'm working on their study habits. My, my goal is to, 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 to work on the, on um, develops those in the bridge program so that we can do more fun stuff in the classroom. Are we good on time? I, I feel. You know, like the, I think active learning has really spoiled me and made me really nervous. Like whenever I hear, uh, when I, whenever there's a crowd that is just willing, that's just sitting there to listen to me that I get a little bit nervous now because I always engage the, <laughs> so I'm going to try to make this an inter interactive talk a little bit, if that's okay, just because, um, because I, I, I have been, this uh, program has given me an opportunity 
to be an interactive teacher, and I want to sort of implement this here as well. Is that okay with everybody? Can I hear yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, so uh, just to give you my background, um, I joined the postdoctoral program in 2016. Uh, first year, 2016-2017, uh, I taught at Yale. And then second year, 2017 to present, I'm teaching at the University of Bridgeport. So, so I'm teaching introductory physics uh, at both these institutions. So I'm just going to get started with the culture of the classroom. And so I think you know, there are some parallels that I've been able to gather teaching in very, um, having this very interesting experience teaching at different institutions at Yale as well as the University of Bridgeport. And I, I, can, I will try to synthesize some of the things that I've learned teaching at these different institutions and see if there are some parallels and some of the things that have worked well in different institutions and also have a conversation about things that I could do better as well. Um, I feel the thing that I've learned is every classroom, may it be at Yale or University of Bridgeport or anywhere, is a result of various complex interaction. I, I, you know, like I feel like going into a classroom thinking that, oh, I'm an experienced teacher and I'm trying to implement certain things. And every time I thought that I had it, every time I thought that I knew what to do, I feel like it's been challenged. You know, like every classroom is different. Every institution is different. And there are interesting dynamics that plays uh, out somehow in a classroom. And so maybe I'll have a little bit of conversation about this. And, there's, and, and I think being a teacher, maybe in physics or in humanities or any discipline, I think it's very important to realize that uh, there's a range of ideas that are represented in the classroom. And different students who come to our classrooms have different reasons why they come to our classroom. And if we don't interact with them, if we don't talk to them, then there's no way we can actually know what their motivations are and what their interests are. And how can we peer, uh, how, how can we understand their motivation is some of the things that I've been thinking about in the last couple of years. And only way that we can know about our students is by being connected with them. And how can we connect with them? And not just being connected with students, the faculty and students being connected to each other, but allowing an environment where students can connect with each other and form that community that some of my other colleagues have already talked about. So I'm just going to start off with a group discussion. You know, some of us are teachers here, and some of us are interested in teaching. So let's just have a conversation about what are the few things that you have tried or would like to try uh, to make your classroom inclusive. Can we have a group discussion? Uh, maybe like find a partner next to you and have a conversation. I know you guys are ready to talk to each other. So <laughs> yeah. get to know each other. And so yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm, I'm just, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, okay. Uh, so can I can I have everybody's attention back again? Okay. Uh, can I get you know like part of the reason I do this, part of the reason now I've been teaching in this sort of mode. Like if I just talk, I get so nervous. I don't know if you guys have this, like you know, like people who have implemented, you know, interactive teaching. I, I just cannot not make other people talk in my classroom because I do it for myself more than, I mean, I, of course I do it for the students as well, but I do it for myself as well. But can I hear some some strategies, maybe from somewhere from the back? Um, can you guys, uh, uh, you know, like uh, tell me what the strategies that you have used or think are useful? Anybody? I know you guys were talking. Okay, right at the back. So I feel that uh, thoroughly, and so if I'm lecturing, I hate it. I hate lecturing, but yeah. I will look at students' faces, and you can see like responses, even if they're negative sometimes. Yeah. And trying to just draw students in who um, may think that they don't agree with you or that they don't understand something, and using their own sort of like body language to yeah. to get a classroom to open up a little bit. I see. What's your name again? Michelle. Michelle. Okay, can we give a round of applause for Michelle? <laughs> okay. 
I just wanted to give a glimpse of my classroom. This is how, you know, like if I were to call somebody, I just want to, like, you know, if I call somebody, I ask them to, I ask all the students to give uh, a round of applause. So I just, it just creates a sort of subtle thing, but it's a community that is developed through, you know, like supporting each other. And that's, I think that's really important. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, um, I will move forward. So some of the things that I have implemented is an active classroom, which is uh, vital to creating that sort of community um, and, and, and uh, community between uh, people who are teaching, but as well as between students. Uh, getting to know students outside of physics, you know, like outside, just beyond their names, is absolutely important to make sure that there's that trust between students and faculty. And then also reinforcing the love of learning, right? So I, I will talk about these three things in the next uh, few slides that I have. So um, here is the teal classroom. So I want to say this is the talk about tables. Uh, <laughs> this is not exactly the talk. Well, this is partly the talk about tables, but I, I didn't, uh, like Claudia talked a lot about the teal classroom. So I, like there's a lot of things that Claudia and also Marco has talked about that overlaps with my own experience as well. And so certainly like my experience in Teal has been extremely positive. I encourage active learning, group projects, and team-based problem solving in this environment. And so, you know, like I think somebody already asked how difficult it is when there's a Serengeti of this room, you know, like it's far away. And, but, but I feel like one thing that I've realized about Teal Classroom is even though there are a large number of students as well as a smaller number of students, this sort of collaborative, you know, table-like environment works extremely well. Uh, for creating that community. Uh, so this was my experience at Yale, and then I went to University of Bridgeport. Um, and so, so what, what did I do at University of Bridgeport? So there's an active learning. So I, I wanted to reinforce the same experience that I had here, and I wanted to take it to the University of Bridgeport. So University of Bridgeport does not have the teal or so-called teal classroom, but I don't think it's necessary. That's the most important thing that I wanted to point out. The great thing that happened when I went to the University of Bridgeport was that I realized that these, uh, these, these tables and desks that are movable, right? So like I, I see like some of the students are nodding very happily. And so, so like all we had to do was to move these desks around. And that's all we had to do because the students, uh, the size of the students that, uh, the number of students that I taught at uh, Bridgeport, uh, the class number were about 30 or so. And so, you know, like, uh, so I emulated the same model uh, there are movable desks and chairs, and I created this sort of community where students are actually talking to each other, much like in the teal setting. It's essentially the same idea, uh, without the acronym. So, um, and it's and 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 I feel the effect is the same. Um, I think, much like Claudia alluded, um, I think these kind of environments where our students are are working in groups, uh, it's particularly beneficial for students who are un underrepresented in science, uh, students who have low confidence. Um, and uh, in, in, in their ability to learn physics. And I think you, like anybody who's worked in this sort of setting uh, and have done it somewhat well have, has this experience. So, so that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about, which is active learning. The second thing about the inclusive teaching strategies, and these are by no means exhaustive, uh, that I want to talk about is <clears throat> we have to be interested, I feel, uh, towards students as human beings. And so, uh, so these are some of the examples um, that I have, you know, like try to, uh, try to be, uh, try to be close to students by attending some of the events that students would invite me. Like, so here's a ballet. In general, I, I'm not interested in ballet, but I would go there anyway. But and I thought, okay, this is something that I, I can take interest in. You know, students can teach you so much. Is something that I have learned over this experience. Um, here's. Um, Here's a, a play, uh, Julius Caesar, and here's my student right there, Zeb, and I didn't know he was so vicious in his, <laughs> in his acting. He, there he is being Cassius, Cassius, and I didn't, I hadn't seen a better Cassius uh, in my life. And so, and so, like, you know, like this sort of connection, sorry, you, you have? You're biased. I'm certainly biased, but you know, uh, but but I, yeah, I'm certainly biased about this. But but this was an amazing experience because I can see these students outside of class, and they, they and and Claudia and I are teaching this class called Being Human STEM, and seeing their humanity, even though they're uh, about to kill uh, poor uh, uh, Julius Caesar out there, is is quite refreshing. So uh, <laughs> so that's 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 another thing. And then um, you know, like this is certainly like one thing. Obviously, you know, like like everybody has schedule constraints, and you know, you cannot go to plays or you know like or activities that students but you know like whenever there's a cafeteria and there's a student sitting by themselves if you can offer to like sit by them it's a small gesture that can make such a big impact not only with that student but 
but the student community at large, and this is something that I've learned teaching at these institutions. Uh, certainly, like feedback is another way of connecting with students. Um, uh, you know, like here is an example, a very recent example of uh, students telling me what they have not learned well in class and what are their challenges. Here's a here's an email that just came yesterday, or was it day before yesterday, where like student had we were doing electric circuits and they. Uh, they thanked me for certain things that I did well, and they also wanted me to touch on certain <coughs> topics. So if I did not have these feedbacks, I would not know what their interests are, right? Like, I mean, a teaching cannot be a one-way street. We just have to get as much feedback as possible from students. And so that's another thing that I've learned from this experience. And then there is a, um, another thing that I wanted to touch. Um, here's a, a question for you. So there are like three choices, so we're going to vote with one, two, and three. And so, like, are you guys ready? Are you guys, do you need more time to answer these questions? <laughs> okay, on the count of three, it has to be simultaneous. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, let's yell it out. One, two, three. Fun. Fun, okay. Yeah, there should be no dividing line between fun and physics. I think, you know, like, like how can you be motivated to learn something that you're not interested in? Here's an example of, uh, you know, like, uh, I wish I had taken more videos while I was teaching. But so here's an example of some serendipitous moment that happened in a classroom. I was doing this sort of launching of a ring, and somebody's watch came about. And <laughs> uh, so, so certainly that they're having fun. And I think you know, like this is sort of emblematic of uh, the classroom that I try to create. Um, and, and that sort of motivates them to learn physics as well. Um, oops, sorry. So now, so I want to stop here and, and can you like talk about, can you like maybe have a discussion about a couple more inclusive strategies maybe? Can you, can you, can you think of a couple more inclusive strategies and then I'll, I'll show you a couple more and then I'll end the talk. Okay, maybe a couple more inclusive strategies. <laughs> I think I do. <laughs> um, I I hate to I hate I really hate to Is this the way to do it? I really hate to cut this short you guys. Um this is really hard to stop I guess. <laughs> okay. You know, like, I really hate to cut this short. I know how much fun it is to talk to each other. You know, like, there's no point learning if you cannot share it with others. And this is something that you have demonstrated in this small, um, in this small conversation. But can we talk about a couple more teaching strategies? Uh, anybody who's itching to answer? It will, uh, somebody? Yes. With regard to group work, what I enjoy doing and what my students end up enjoying doing yeah. is I break them up into teams of four. And for yeah. some reason, the yeah. four is a magic number. And I have them do a quiz. Yeah. I, they set up a blank page, they do their quizzes, they work together to put together the quiz questions, and then I have the group swap the quizzes. Yeah. So I, I use it as not only a learning tool and a review, but it, it's also good for them to really understand it at a different level. Yeah. So it's not that just they're just answering it, they have to actually formulate the question, they have to formulate the answers, and then they have to explain it to the other group if they get it wrong. Yeah. So it's kind of a win-win. A sure. What's your name? Uh, Joan Lloyd, Chair of the Mass Science Department at Housatonic. Can you give her a round of applause again? <laughs> so I'm gonna end with some uh, teaching strategies, and I know a lot of you are, have thought about it as deeply as I have or more. Um, so exam corrections are one of the things that I've learned from Claudia, actually. So I am indebted to her uh, for teaching me about exam corrections, which sort of lowers the stake. And you know, it's a metacognitive activity. And um, you know, students get, like you know, you, you you know, a lot of times students just 
throw their exams after if they don't do well. And they never learn that topic. And our goal is to teach students, right? And so use that as an opportunity to have metacognition and also solidify like their, their understanding, especially in physics and other t science courses. They build on one after the other. And so having that uh, uh, exam correction is amazing uh, way of, uh, way, way of um, you know, like, like making sure that especially under, under, underprepared students are, 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 are understanding the material well. Incorporating diversity in the curriculum in general, like you know, like I, I'm done with putting in pictures of Einstein and Bohr in, in my slides. I'm just done about you know, and so that's another thing. I just want to be more um, um, like inclusive in terms of you know, like science as a as a an endeavor that can be done by just about everybody, uh, and and making you know, like like giving different ways of actually uh, making like you know, like 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 when you're teaching circuits, for instance, you can like show simulations and their equations and then bunch of ways so that students can access, different people with different ways of learning can access, um, access, learn, uh, access the material in different ways. And then finally, like, you know, like I think probably most importantly, I didn't know, I don't know how, why I, I have a reason why I spelled that wrong because I just added that, uh, like sneakily, like when I was sitting there. <laughs> and part of the reason is um, me and Brett, we were having lunch before this. And student uh, who uh, was in my class last semester uh, came to me and said, uh, can I give you a hug? And I think that's sort of emblematic of my experience here, really. I feel like you know, I've learned and also felt love of and warmth of so many students. And I took a I took bunch of selfies with students, but I just thought of him and I added this picture. And so this sort of, oh. sort of <laughs> this is like, so Francis is the student here uh, to the right and left, it was Malaika. And Francis gave me a bear hug just before <laughs> I came here. <laughs> and so I just thought that I should include his picture there. So I'll stop here, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Sivan, how do you get to know students in a really large class? Um, you know, like, I think there is a cutoff that I feel. Uh, so the largest class I feel is 55, where I can know students, not just know them, but I know their lives beyond, you know, like their, their names. I know what their majors are, what state they are from, or what country they are from. Um, so certainly, like, getting feedback is the way to know their lives beyond the classroom, right? So, like, um, so I, like, you know, like, in terms of, so even during the previous, like, beginning of the semester, um, when I have, let's say, a pre-class uh, homework or something, which I often have to, uh, uh, to, to have classroom time um, used for conceptual questions and so on, one of the questions is, like, what do you like to do? Or do you like the donut that I brought to you the other day? Or, you know, like, like what are your interests? What, what, like, so those are the questions that one can incorporate along with um, you know, like questions about physics that you'd ask, and I think it's, it builds that trust. I think it's certainly incremental. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. When you get to know students this well, and, and you really uh, understand their life, uh, does it get harder to, to grade yeah. them when they don't do well? <laughs> Emotionally harder. Um, I think it does, uh, in a, and that's a very good question. I think one. Um, Certainly, so like you know, like like a good practice in general is like blind grading as much as possible without having, without seeing their names. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be some creeping, you know, like 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 because if you know the students, you've read their materials, so you know their writing and so on. So if you're grading this all the time, then you cannot, you know, like do that well all the time. Uh, yeah. So like I think it's sometimes it. I think it's it's. Uh, it could be sometimes hard to be completely fair. Uh, uh, but you know, one one does the best one can, I guess. Yeah. 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 Comment about no more pictures about Einstein or Bohr. Yeah. So do you instead tell different biographies during the term, or have you sort of <coughs> lost the historical focus? <laughs> I I try not to have a historical focus because you know, like, um, you know, like certainly there are a handful of people like who are women or people of color. Who have contributed to science, but it is disproportionately, you know, like that. that like we just have to acknowledge that in a sense. But that gives a false impression in some sense that this, these are the only people who can do physics or math and so on. Uh, so certainly, I bring examples uh, whenever I can of people um, who have, uh, you know, like 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 for instance in math, for instance, I would bring sometimes Emmy Neuter or something. But 
but then like you know like it's hard to exactly tell what is the like you know like introductory physics it's hard to make that relation between symmetry and conservation laws or something of that sort right so it sometimes could be a stretch but but uh, yeah i think like whenever i get a chance i would bring examples which are not usually represented but the examples that are overrepresented i try to just not talk about it yeah Let's thank you <clears throat> yeah. thank you All right, so I've, uh, I've had an unbelievable experience over the past three years, and uh, the partnership between Yale and Housatonic has been incredible. Um, and I have you know, a story similar to a lot of what you've heard so far, but right now I'm gonna zoom way in and talk about one particular project. Uh, and uh, to do that, we're gonna play a video game. Does that sound okay? Okay. You don't have a choice. <laughs> so this was a project that was uh, helped with funding from uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, and as you just saw there, there was a oops, uh, there was a company we worked with to help uh, code the game. Um, and this, this project was joint with the uh, uh, Yale Math Department and in particular with Jim Rolf. Um, we, we kind of... Uh, collaborated uh, on this entire project. But um, I'm going to start by just showing rather than telling you guys. So uh, as you can see, it's not advanced graphics. Um, but what we have is a game that's a two-player game. And the setup is similar to something like uh, Battleship, where uh, as right now I'm the red player, and I'm going to start um, placing uh, these targets. So now I've s switched the blue player would go and they'd place their target. And um, like Battleship, um, we're going to think that eventually you're going to try to hit your opponent's targets. So of course in Battleship, you know, you have some strategy that you're going for and some reason why you're doing the things you're doing. Um, I'm probably not going to do the best job right here, but Ultimately, I'm going to be trying to, as the blue player, hit those red targets and make it difficult for the red player to hit the blue targets. So maybe that one will hide behind. All right, so once we've created the setup, um, the game has begun, and um, each player is dealt a hand of cards. And these cards have simple functions on them. And the idea is I'm going to try to create a curve that um, is hitting those blue targets right now. So I'll start with a nice linear function. Um, each of the cards has a slider with uh, an associated parameter. Um, and so I'm not going to belabor this too much. But once I'm happy with my decision, um, I'm going to click that shoot button. Um, and we'll see. So I've hit the blue target. That was good. Then I hit the red one, which was my own. That was bad. So it stopped the curve. Um, and Oh, let's see, I don't have, I don't have uh, fun cards here, so I'm going to click a redraw. And um, I'm going to go back because there were some fun ones there. Okay, so now it's the blue player's turn. I'm going to play a, a sine curve. Um, and oh, so this is not so good a parameter. I'm going to go with a cosine. And what I'm doing is uh, creating these curves and really just playing with what's possible, right? I, there, there's not some motivating lesson going on. I'm just playing around with um, what's happening. And um, I don't know. We can get crazy here. And we could uh, start, say, multiplying functions um, or even um, one thing that students really struggle with is thinking about this idea of composition and what happens if you compose functions. So we had to think about how do we get an interface that allows for composition and you can see you can start to get some pretty wild things. So I think we'll shoot that. That was pretty good. All right. So there's your preview. This, this is what we created. And um, now I'm going to tell you about a little bit about why we created it, how we used it with students, and um, where, uh, where we think it's going. OK. So uh, we call this game Carts. 
Um, I don't know. I don't know why exactly. I mean, it comes from Descartes, but uh, uh, I kind of like the name anyway. Um, so I, I'm going to zoom back out again. Um, we had David Brassoud come and give a talk in our STEM education series. Uh, David Brassoud um, is uh, in charge of this program, Characteristics of Successful Programs in College Calculus through the MAA. And um, he's uh, described uh, what he calls the perfect storm in um, college calculus, which is that greater numbers of students um, who are less prepared are using, uh, uh, sorry, we're teaching greater numbers of students um, who are less prepared using fewer resources uh, with increased expectations of what's possible. And so this is, the, this is the perfect storm. Those of us who teach calculus have some sense of, um, uh, of, of the, what's going on. And, and it's, it is a big challenge. And, um, and in David's uh, talk, uh, he put up this one graphic that I found really interesting and important. And so interesting and important that I'm not going to tell you what it says. I want you guys to think about what it says. So we're going to do a think, pair, share. Um, we're not going to talk for about 30 seconds or so. You're going to do your best to read what's on the screen. You don't, this isn't that important. That's the source I can tell you where it's coming from. But I want you to see if you can uh, determine what this graph says. Um, it took me a, a while. Okay, so now it's already started naturally, but you can do the pairing. So I'd like you to talk to your neighbor about what you see. This isn't obvious. And, um, so don't be, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Uh, All right, we'll, we'll stop people here and we'll see if this technique works. Okay, good. So, uh, has anybody gotten any clarity on uh, what this study was saying? Yeah. Uh, that means uh, students who have taken the college pre calculus, the performance is less. Uh, in getting good grades in the college calculus compared to the students who have not taken uh, the college pre-calculus. Uh, right, so if we've, if we've gotten, uh, if somehow um, we're very ready based on some score um, for calculus, uh, if we go ahead and then take pre-calculus, um, so uh, I'm going to have to, so this readiness is uh, entering college, um, so this is before they enter college. If um, the student goes on to take pre-calculus and then calculus, uh, good preparation results in worse outcomes in calculus. <laughs> that's weird. Um, that's weird. But there's also this other side of the graph which says, okay, suppose some student is underprepared. And so this readiness score is an amalgamation of their grades in high school, whether or not they took AP courses, um, SAT scores, uh, a lot of things. Um, but it's some way of comparing. By the way, this study was done with um, 10,000 students, so there's big numbers. Um, but what, what's this side of the graph saying? I'll tell you. It's saying there's some inversion, right? Calculus, pre-calculus should help, but not really, <laughs> right? These are the exact same students, and what happened? They took a semester taking pre-calculus. There's no statistical di difference in the outcome. So, okay, we could probably talk for the rest of my time about that. Um, but let's just leave it at this is concerning. This is concerning. Um, and, uh, and so the video game is trying to address uh, these concerns, right? Um, so uh, how did the video game come about? We, um, I, I came to Yale, and Jim Rolfe was having uh, conversations with uh, Lynn Filan and uh, Kimberly J. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. I should ask her. Um, but the, they have a Center for Health and Learning Games, and um, they were creating games to help um, the community understand health issues. Um, and they found that through gaming, they could really make an impact on, on outcomes. And they said, math is an open space. We think games are the way to um, um, provide interventions, and, and you could... Um, 
you could really do something here. And so um, we, we worked together as a department and we, we tried to determine what's a problem we think we might be able to address. And a big problem for students entering calculus is that um, they have weak intuition for how, uh, when we think of a function, we can think of it as an equation or we can think of it um, in terms of a graph and they have weak intuition for how to go back and forth between those different worlds. This is a big problem. And so um, what were we hoping to change? We're hoping to help students just identify basic function types um, from their graph and uh, then have some idea that if we have some parameter associated with a function type, what does that do geometrically? Um, and then think about how do we um, build functions up from these basic types. So the first thing we did, we, we um, ordered pizza and we invited students to come and play the game at night. Um, they essentially volunteered. We, we um, sent an invitation to a lot of students and uh, we had a lot of fun. We had three nights where they played the game. They played for about an hour. It went really well. We were very excited. Um, uh, Jim and I um, sort of observed the students as they were playing um, and you know, they were talking to each other. Um, and then we talked to them afterwards. They said they were making patterns, um, the things you want to hear. Um, they said it was fun. We were witnessing them having fun. So we were, we were really excited. This was in the fall of 2016. Um, and so we went on and uh, did another iteration with the company that we were working with. And um, then we thought about, can we integrate this into a, a course that's um, already happening, which is a course um, designed by John Hall, which is targeted at um, students entering with weak backgrounds. And it's a year-long course in which the pre-calculus ideas, function sense is built into um, the curriculum. And this course has uh, weekly workshops um, as part of the class that are led by undergraduate learning assistants. And so we said we're going to go hands off, we're going to give them this game, and we're going to try to study the effects of, of um, how students um, engage with it. So they played the single player version, they played a multiplayer version, um, we gave some concept tests before the gameplay and after, and then we had a survey. And so um, what were we trying to do? We were trying to understand um, some basic things. Do students enjoy playing the game and what are the aspects of it that are fun for them? What should we focus on if, if we think that this is something that's going to motivate them? Um, do they think that they can help them learn? What's their perception of what's happening in terms of the learning going on? And then can we actually affect learning? Um, so for the rest of my time, I'm just going to focus on uh, do students think that this game can help them learn? Right? We're, we tried to attack this, um, this question. And the first thing we saw was that um, they seemed to agree that by playing with somebody else that they were, uh, they were learning something. So the interaction was helpful to their learning. Um, and uh, when we asked them in what ways did the game help you learn, <laughs> we got some interesting responses. In fact, I like focusing on the more negative kind of snarky responses because I think they tell you more. I do this in my own course evaluations, right? It's tough, but you have to take it maybe with a grain of salt. Um, so this student said, well, the game didn't help me. My partner helped me, <laughs> which <laughs> that's exactly what we wanted to hear, of course. Maybe that's not what this student would have expected, but. Um, then uh, we asked them whether or not they agreed or disagreed with this statement. statement. Um, if I were to keep playing this game, would I do better in this course? Okay, so we asked them, you know, do you agree or disagree? So I'm just curious here, um, I want to get a thumbs up if you think that a student would agree with this and a thumbs down if you think a student would disagree with this. So let's you think for a second, then I'll say go, Mark. Mark you want to okay, ready, set, <laughs> go. Okay, a lot of thumbs up, some thumbs down. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they didn't think it was going to happen. Um, they didn't think it was going to happen. And uh, I saw John Hall's here, he gave a thumbs down. So he has some, some <laughs> insight into the student's psyche. Uh, maybe this isn't a surprise, but um, 
but it's good to know, right? We need, we need to know this if, if we want to use this. And so a student said, I ended up learning more by, uh, about strategizing by clicking rather than using my understanding of functions. And this is a concern that they'd just mess around and not really pay attention. And they said, it's not really helpful for this class. Okay. Next question, um, a better understanding of functions would give me an advantage in this game. So I want you to think, what would a student respond? Thumbs up for I agree, thumbs down for I disagree with this. Okay, ready, set, go. Okay, now almost uniformly thumbs up. Yeah, they really agreed. If I just knew about functions, this would be, be you know, this, I'd be much better at this game. Um, and a student said, you know, you should ensure students have a better understanding of functions beforehand. <laughs> right? I mean, these are students in the class where we're supposed to, I mean, and, and we're doing a good job. We're, you know, this is, this is working. It's just, it's amazing to see how these students' brains are processing this stuff. And it's, again, not surprising when you know the students, but it's, you know, uh, I don't know exactly how to take this data, but it's definitely helpful as I'm thinking <laughs> about the game. Um, yeah, so it's this comparison that's very uh, striking, um, this disconnect between, um, you know, how do you learn, right? Uh, okay, so just some reasons to be excited about what we've done so far. Um, the students are, we've witnessed have engaged in peer instruction. Um, they're making predictions and getting immediate feedback, right? You can see right away what's happening. Um, and through doing that, they're recognizing patterns. We know this pattern recognition is really important. Um, and they're creating some new context through which they're thinking about these functions. Um, but we have reservations. And the reservations are that, you know, often students will resort to guess and check. As they said click uh, rather than um, thinking about what's happening. And uh, I mean, I think this is a big one. They, they tend to approach this with a fixed mindset, um, which is, uh, we know, concerning. Um, and it's interesting because I saw a game as a vehicle where you might think, oh, well, of course I get better. You get better at any game. <laughs> but but they, they're perceiving it, especially at least within the context we presented it, as, you know, well, I, you know, I'm not good at this. Um, and they're not correlating the success between what's happening in the game and, and what could happen in the course. So um, that's, that's what we've done, and I'd love to have your um, comments and questions. In the, the back, yeah. uh, my question is about the game itself. Mm -hmm. Are the students playing on one computer or laptop side by side and they see everything? Yes, yeah, so right okay. now it's pretty low tech and we just have them, yeah, at a desk, but actually, Right, I see that as an advantage, right? It's just like you want to have them at the same table, you want to have them at the same computer. And often they'll, they were talking about, they would strategize together even though they were competing or you know, they'd learn something based on what the other person was doing. Yep. Uh, you broke down your results by gender, so. Mm -hmm. Because I keep getting that question. I mean, our numbers are tiny, there's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you can draw some inferences, you know, there's, it's way too small. I'm concerned that the male respondents were more excited about this than the females. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a concern, and so we want to make sure we're keeping track of that. Yeah, um, we, we did talk. Um, so we talked about this, and you know, having a competitive game versus a sort of collaborative or just single-player game, whether that might have t some different um, appeals. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, Brett, were, was the game only available during class time, or were they able to put it on their own computer, take it home? They, they it downloaded out? it. Um, they, can, they can take it. Uh, yeah, the, it's a prototype, <coughs> and it has problems. And so, yeah, uh, like, um, my computer tends to overheat when I run the game for too long. <laughs> and so it, it's very limited. We didn't want to put it out widely, but they, those students that played it do have it on their computer. Um, we could check in if anybody's still playing. I think I talked to some students that were in the initial focus group and they showed it to other people. Uh, I don't know what happened out of the class, whether or not um, people continued to use it. Let's thank Brad again. Okay. 
I want to thank everyone for being here today, and I want to just say a couple of words before we go have a lovely reception to celebrate the accomplishments of these, these wonderful colleagues. So as the PI of this whole project, as many of you know who have written proposals for grant-funded projects, this started with some imagination and some data about opportunities and needs and local parts of the culture at Yale where I thought there was fertile ground for partnership and collaboration. So I want to say a, a couple of things. Beth did a really fantastic job with a long list of people that we want to thank. And I want to say just a few things along those lines. First of all, we have a really great team here in the Center for Teaching and Learning. We have Jennifer Ashley, we have Glenn Davenport, our evaluator, and we have Beth Luoma. And Beth, of course, did not thank herself, so I want to say a few things about Beth. That Beth and I have been working on this project ever since it started, and I had funding to hire her, and it really was just words on a piece of paper. So I have to say thank you, Beth, for seeing my vision, and then I really just got out of your way, because you did a fantastic job. And something that didn't come out fully in the, the presentations yet that Beth really should take the credit for is that she created a community among the scholars. They weren't just out in their departments and off at their schools, but every week they came together. And in fact, I think first Beth, Beth thought it would be every other week, and they said, can we do this every week? Isn't that right? So the group came together weekly. They had each other to talk to about teaching issues. They had, they had each other to think about troubleshooting, they had each other to talk about job searches and what's next, and of course they had Beth supporting and guiding and mentoring them all along the way. So that was something that there really was, I think, an amazing outcome of what Beth created for this, this program. So for that and so much more, thank you very much, Beth. <laughs> and I also want to thank our colleagues in the physics and the math departments here because they had to take a little bit of a risk to accept these postdocs and to uh, include them in the culture and let them loose teaching their students. So we couldn't have done the program without these wonderful partners. So thank you also to our partner departments. And most importantly, I think our partner institutions. A big part of this program was, and a big part of my design was thinking that the, the postdocs experience learning to teach and practicing their craft would be strengthened by teaching in multiple different types of institutions. And I think that's really been the case. So we couldn't have done it without strong partnership from the University of Bridgeport and Housatonic Community College. So thank you partners as well. <laughs> and last and probably most importantly, thank Marco, Claudia, Savan, and Brett. When you started, and, and for some of you I've known since you were graduate students or maybe very recent graduate students, and now I think of you all as colleagues. So thank you for your contributions to this program. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you all.